in a muddle, because I got up this morning and I was just looking at these bags under my eyes here, thinking, shall I try and blot them out or get some raffia and make a feature of them? <laughs> <laughs> and, there's a, <laughs> and there's a ring on the doorbell and it's a taxi driver. And he's looking at me as if I was barmy. I said, what's the matter? Have you never seen a woman in deputy dog pyjamas before? <laughs> I've come to take to the radio station. Oh, I forgot, I suppose to go to this radio station, you see. Play the piano, plug the show. So I leapt in the taxi, leapt out, got dressed, leapt in again. And, <laughs> and I was getting a bit nervous, you see, because I don't like to be late. And for some reason, they always build radio stations near traffic jams. I <laughs> so I ran into the reception and said, I'm Victoria Wood, I'm here to do the early show. Well, she turned her back on me, carried on waxing her bikini line. <laughs> I'm here to do the early show. She said, sorry. I said, Victoria Wood, I'm here to do the early show. She said, hang on, I'll phone them for you. <laughs> and I sat down, doesn't phone them. She's just standing there talking to a security man about grouting or something. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, she notices me on the carpet crying. <laughs> and she phones up and this woman comes to get me, this producer's assistant, Barbara. She's got a clipboard and a cup of coffee around her neck on a thong. <laughs> I said, no, I'm Victoria, what you do? Yes. Oh, follow me. It's just down here. Travel a long way, I'm afraid. Turn left here. Oh, no, sorry, that's the wall. <laughs> I said, um, what's your presenter like? Because I'm feeling a bit nervous. She said, oh, Janice is marvellous. She was just promoted from traffic this morning. I don't know. <laughs> so I get in the studio, and this old Janice in a worse state than me. Like, really tense. In fact, she's got two leads coming from her earrings, and they're running the ceiling fan off her. <laughs> <laughs> she says, um, you're road safety, are you? I said, no, I'm Victoria Wood. I'm here to play the piano. She said, oh, God, oh, God, God, we haven't got a piano. Barbara, where's my tissues? I said, look, I love Blue Peter, but even I can't make a piano out of a box of tissues. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't have to <laughs> I said, oh, 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 we're on the air, we're on the air. I'm talking to, uh, I'm talking to, uh, I'm talking to, uh, Virginia, uh, Wolf, and she's, uh, <laughs> She's uh, doing something in uh, in uh, London at the uh, at the uh, at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah. She said, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Well, I was cross. I was very cross. I went straight home and I went out for a drive in my new car. And if anybody cut me up, I gave them a sharp blast on the windscreen wipers. <laughs> <laughs> And I got home and I was just having, just having a little play with my country diary of an Edwardian lady bulwarker. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a ring at the doorbell and it's this taxi driver again. I thought, well, he just popped back, you know, another look at my jamas. <laughs> I said, I've come to take to the television station. I said, what? And he said, well, you're on the television tonight. I said, well, I can't be, you know, because the pyramid game's finished. <laughs> <laughs> and the next thing I knew, here I am talking to you. And I'm very worried. I've been here 20 minutes and nobody's won a toast at <laughs> Now, it should be a good show tonight because there was a very good horoscope in the mirror today, June Penn. It said, Taurus, you will tell jokes in a red and black jacket and everyone will die laughing. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm Gemini. <laughs> but I need, I need a good night because I had a very weird morning this morning because I woke up this morning there was a completely strange man in the bed beside me. I didn't know who it was. I didn't know what had been going on. I didn't know if anything had been going on. <laughs> so I checked my body for telltale signs. <laughs> and I didn't seem to be particularly bored, so I thought, you know... <laughs> and then I remember that last night, I was in the library, so I'd gone there for the new Shirley Conran book. The menopause and how to make money out of it. <laughs> and I was just flicking to the back of a Margaret Drabble, you know, just to see what didn't happen in the end. And I noticed this strange man looking at me. And I was a bit worried, you see, because there's only two other people in the library. The usual couple of toothless old meth drinkers nodding off by the radiator. How they ever got to be librarians, I don't know. <laughs> looking this man because he had a polo neck on you know no jumper just a polo neck and, and he was standing by the large print section with this large print dictionary i think he was hoping to look up big bosoms and then <laughs> he came over to me and he said would i go for a sausage roll with him but i didn't like to say no because he had a wardrobe in his other hand so <laughs> he went over the road to hilda's calf 
Now, Hilda's quite frightening herself because she's six foot nine and she's got very black hair, very lacquered, sort of like a 78 with Kirby grips in. <laughs> you know, she doesn't wear lipstick, she just smashes herself in the mouth. <laughs> and she's got this most enormous bosom, like a great steep slope. I mean, she really ought to have a sign at the top saying, test your brakes. <laughs> She's wearing this PVC apron with a dead dog on the front of it. <laughs> and her fingers are tattooed here, so that when she laces them together, it spells anthrax. <laughs> oh, please, no time for clapping. Anyway, we're having a cup of tea. It's quite nice. She lets you put your own grease in. And, uh, this man said he was very insecure and that carrying a wardrobe gave him confidence. <laughs> And he was going back in the mental hospital the next morning. <laughs> because there'd been an industrial dispute and they'd sent them all home. He said he'd never had a girlfriend. He said, well, in fact, he said he'd never had a pot noodle. <laughs> he said he wanted to spend one evening with a woman, you know, doing everything that normal couples do. And I said, all right, come back with me to my flat and we'll pretend we live together. We'll do everything that that entails. <gasps> what a night. <laughs> we put shelves up. <laughs> a row about whose turn it was to clean the grill pan. <laughs> but he was quite a nice man. Oh, I never told you what my real horoscope said in the mirror this morning, June pen. It said, Gemini, you will go out with the same strange man two nights running, and tonight it's your turn to carry the wardrobe. <laughs> Now, I might have to cough tonight, you see, because I've been swimming a lot, and I go at White City, and there's a terrible draft when the greyhounds go past. <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge swimming pool. It's sort of upmarket municipal. You know, the soup machine's got croutons. They play labisifrit. It's a sort of club. We all go very early in the morning, and we all wear nose clips. I think they look silly with a coat and skirt, but I don't know. <laughs> um, it's mainly women. There's the odd man, you know, ploughing up and down like a hairy torpedo. <laughs> mainly it's women, and they all swim with their heads out of the water so they don't splash the cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> they talk all the time, they're swimming, they go, <gasps> Robert's a fiend for sex. <laughs> so I just stay downstairs and plump up the cushions. <laughs> Oh, and then I lost a contact lens in the pool and they had to drain the whole pool and I was in a bit of a rush, so I just grabbed the first thing I could see and I'm not sure this isn't a Veruca. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I caught this cough or inhaled a corn plaster or something. <laughs> I thought, well, I can't be coughing all night, you know, the other people in the hostel won't like it. So I thought, well, I'd better go to the doctor. Now, I hadn't been to the doctor for years, not since I thought you had to be inoculated for the Isle of Man. So... <laughs> I went over there somewhere where the, all the back streets are and I saw this little plaque that said Dr. Greville, fully qualified doctor and carpet fitter. <laughs> Let us loose lay your lino. So there was a little door, it was set in between a turf accountant's and a shop with a window full of ball cocks. So I went in, opened the door, there's a rich whiff of damp trouser. And I followed that upstairs. <laughs> I followed it upstairs to the waiting room, which was full of very poorly looking people. But even the goldfish had a little scarf around its neck. <laughs> and I went up to the receptionist and she said, can I help you? And I said, yes, you can put that machine gun down, please. <laughs> I said, can I see the doctor? She said, I'm afraid that's not possible. I said, well, can you draw me a picture of him? <laughs> by the time I got in to see him, the price of fish fingers had gone up three times. <laughs> he was very nice. He had a touch of the DTs. Right, I thought his desk had just clicked onto final rinse and spin. <laughs> you could tell he liked to drink because the surgical spirit was lined up next to the slimline tonic and the ice bucket. <laughs> but he gave me a quick examination, you know, just with the one eye, and uh, he gave me a prescription which turned out to be a luncheon voucher for a barium meal. So I didn't. Have that. <laughs> so I went three doors down to the chemist because I'd heard all those adverts, you know, ask your chemist, they know everything. So of course there was a long queue of people checking upon the theory of relativity. So, I went to the assistant, who was a little bit dim. She was stood there rubbing up her engagement ring with a bunion pad. I thought, no, it's nice to know people can be vacant and engaged at the same time. And I, said, I said, have you got anything for a sore throat? And she said, have you tried sucking a nigroid? And I said, I don't think television is ready for this kind of thing. She said, the best thing for a sore throat is those little black things in a tin, you know, like sucking little bits of tarmac. And they're great. And I went home, 
sucking away and the phone rang and it was my friend and she said I've got your contact lens I said that's great so I've got to go now and give her back a Veruca <laughs> Well, I've had a very exciting day today, as you know. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was in bed about three o'clock this morning, couldn't sleep. I was listening to the radio. It was the King Singers doing a lovely version of Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick. <laughs> <laughs> Not too hard, this is cashmere. And, uh, <laughs> and somebody chucked a brick through the front window. I thought, oh, blimey, I'm obviously about to be kidnapped by right-wing international terrorists, you know. I used to have to spend the next six months in a Sicilian broom cupboard. <laughs> so I just packed a few cosmetics and a travel iron, and I went downstairs. <laughs> and there was nobody there. I thought, oh, well, they've obviously got fed up waiting for me, and they've gone next door and kidnapped Betty Freeman, you see. No, because she likes to be held hostage most winters. <laughs> and because it's such a saving on your central heating. <laughs> there was a great gale blown in through the window, so I went back to bed, went to sleep, and the phone rang. <gasps> Hello? Hello? That's me shouting into a cocoa mug with my eyes shut. <laughs> and it was my heavy breather, my little heavy breather that phones me up. And he said, uh, Victoria, are you sleeping naked? I said, well, I'm not tonight, it's too cold. <laughs> and he said, well, in that case, can I come round and flog you in an electric blanket? I said, no. <laughs> Went back to sleep. I was asleep again. The phone rang. <gasps> Hello? Hello? Well, this time it was a magazine phoning. Now, I thought, that's clever with no fingers. Don't be silly. No. <laughs> It was a woman from a magazine. It was that one they sell in supermarkets. You know, the one that's at the checkout, just under the Wrigley's. <laughs> she knows. I only ever buy it if I get stuck in a queue behind someone who's paying by cheque for one club biscuit and a duster. <laughs> this woman said to me, am I speaking to Victoria Ward's secretary? And I said, oh, yes, trying to sound as if I had nail varnish on. <laughs> she said, we'd like her to do a fashion feature. I said, Hel what? I said, there must be some mistake. You must be mixing it with Benny Hill. You know? <laughs> I'm not very fashion conscious, you know, as long as it's this year's gravy spilt down the front, I'm happy. <laughs> I said, you, do you know I'm not a very good shape? You know, I said, I feel I've done for the body beautiful what Norman Fowler's done for the National Health Service. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Only slower. <laughs> She said, I said, do you know what I look like? Have you ever seen me on the television? And she said, no, I only watch the show jumping. I said, well, imagine a bale of hay with bosom. <laughs> and she said, no, I don't see that. I said, well, imagine a horse box with highlights. <laughs> she said, no, I'm not with you. I said, well, it's a good job because there's broken glass. People keep chucking bricks through the window. <laughs> she said, Victoria, let me just take your measurements. I said, well, all right, but we may have to stop halfway through for you to refill your biro. <laughs> Terrible written down my measurements, they look really metric. <laughs> you could dial them and get straight through to the Midland Bank Bulawayo. <laughs> there was a very nasty silence when I finished the last one, and I could hear her saying, Tabitha, <laughs> ditch the jumpsuits. <laughs> she said, uh, Victoria, I see you in a beige caftan. I said, Well, I see you in an oxygen tent and put the phone on. <laughs> I felt a bit low then, you know, a bit depressed. The sort of mood where you eat dry Weetabix and watch the open university. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had this brilliant idea and I phoned her back and I said, yes, I will have that caftan. Because I just thought, you know, it's going to be another cold night. It'll be the perfect thing for tacking round me bay window. So I <laughs> oh, I'm tired. I've just come back from Coventry, you see. It's nice, have you been there? Yes. I went round the cathedral. I got in a bit of a muddle, though. I thought it was habitat. <laughs> <laughs> There's me looking for roller blinds. There's all these people on their knees praying. <laughs> I thought, well, I know Terence Conran does a good job. <laughs> I, went, I went to Coventry to do this cabaret, and the woman that had organised it was called Pam. Well, it was called Pam, actually. <laughs> but she, was very, she was the complete opposite of me. She was very small and very neat. I mean, I'm a mess, really. I mean, I look all right tonight because I've been dressed, you know, but... <laughs> Normally, I look like I've just stumbled up an embankment after a derailment. <laughs> but this woman, Pam, she, she was terribly middle class, you know. I mean, she had everything middle class. She had a ceramic hob and a loft conversion and a daughter with anorexia. <laughs> and I went to Pam's house <laughs> for a drink. Oh, it was a horrible house. I mean, it, it looked like a discount warehouse for Capo de Monte. <laughs> 
everything was hidden inside something else. You know, the television was inside a Chippendale bureau, and the toaster was inside a harpsichord. <laughs> <laughs> and Pam was a very organised person. I mean, she, she carried a kidney donor card, but she'd altered it. It said, in the event of my death, I would like to donate my handbag. <laughs> She drove me to the cabaret, to this hotel, and it went quite well. It was for Weight Watchers, you know. It was a full house. There was three of them. <laughs> but I slept the night in the hotel, and it was terrible, because the walls were so thin. I could hear the next-door man's nose hair rustling. <laughs> and I had a horrible breakfast brought to me in the room by this Spanish waiter, and his trousers were so tight, I could read the washing instructions on his underpants. <laughs> on the breakfast when I cut my lip on the fried egg. <laughs> and of course, typical hotel, you know, they delivered me the wrong newspapers. There was no exchange in Mart. <laughs> no bunty. <laughs> They'd given me a Daily Star and a magazine. Now, the Daily Star was quite good because there was a competition in it, because they'd hidden this little piece of news on one of the pages. <laughs> This magazine, I can't, I can't tell you what it was called, but the cover was a young girl wearing nothing but a bobble hat and an adjustable spanner. <laughs> but it was a very rude magazine. In fact, it was so rude, I've had to spend the last eight hours reading it. Because <laughs> I just couldn't tear myself away from those pictures of the readers' wives. You know, and men sending photos of their wives, sitting at home, relaxing. <laughs> I really have never seen so many nasty-looking headboards. <laughs> I blame the instant camera. <laughs> because you couldn't do it before that. I mean, what could you do? You have to go in a photo booth. <laughs> and who wants to crouch naked on a revolving stone? <laughs> oh, you do, do you? <laughs> stood in the middle of Woolworths waiting for them to come out. I mean, it's four minutes. It's a long time to be stood goose pimply by the pick and mix, really. <laughs> these, these readers' wives, I mean, they were ex some very extraordinary looking people. They look like the colour supplement of the Lancet. <laughs> but the best thing is with readers' wives, you see, you flick through and you might see someone you know. Because I look through and who did I see? Yes, Pam! <laughs> Pam from Coventry. Well, I, you know, I wasn't familiar with her awful bosoms, but I recognised a magnificent Capo de Monte. <laughs> there's something funny going on tonight. You know, I think there's going to be a surprise party, because it's the last show in the series. I'm not very good at all that sort of thing, you know, dressing up and makeup. I remember when Blusher first came in, and I used to put blusher on and shader and highlighter, and have this big red shiny face. People used to try and direct me to the Burns unit. <laughs> Sex always comes up at parties, and it's never been a strong point with me. <laughs> it's not that I don't like it, I just don't like things that stop you seeing the television. <laughs> I think it I think it stems from school, you know, where there was nowhere to do it. <laughs> no, I still know people who can't really let themselves go unless they've got their heads jammed up against a drinking fountain. <laughs> I hope there isn't a party, because I always get there too early. If I'd always get everywhere too early, I'd turn up at funerals before people have died. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful when you get at a party too soon and you see them through the windows running about in their curlers jamming old tights down the piano. <laughs> and I can't talk to people, so I always end up clearing glasses and wiping the ashtrays, you know. To get invitations now that say, don't bring a bottle, bring a damp cloth. <laughs> And I can't remember people's names. I can't introduce anybody. If I have to say, oh, this is, I always go, and this is... <laughs> <laughs> the last big party I went to do ended up in the TB clinic. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you try and hide in the kitchen, and it's, it's full of women perched on the draining board yapping about cystitis. <laughs> there isn't a party because I always get stuck with the men no one else will talk to. I remember one man with the most appalling toupee. I thought at first he had a very tired gerbil on the top of his head. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kissing him, you see, because that seemed preferable to talking to. And it was the sort that gets his tongue right in there and has a good root round. <laughs> something, I want to be tongue sore. I can't get 
Get away from boring people. I'm always getting stuck on landings with couples who've done their own conveyancing. <laughs> I got stuck with a man who'd done his own vasectomy. <laughs> I said, surely you need one other person to put their finger on the knot. <laughs> I hope it's not going to be a party where they play charades. I remember one terrible time when a little old lady, she had to mime Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy from Company B. <laughs> and she said, I'm going to do the whole thing in one. <laughs> Nobody had an idea what she was doing. After four hours, they had to call an ambulance. <laughs> I, really, I really hate the end of parties when it's three o'clock in the morning, everybody's doing the wrong harmonies to Eleanor Rigby. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about loon pants. <gasps> oh, hey, it's not going to be a surprise party. It's going to be This Is Your Life. Because Eamon Andrews is over there disguised as a chemical toilet. <laughs> Bet nobody likes me enough to go on it. <laughs> There'll be nobody to sit in the next chair. I'll be the only person who's ever gone on it who has to hold hands with their own tumble dryer. <laughs> oh, what? Oh, no, beg your pardon. It's not Eamon Andrews. It is a chemical toilet. <laughs> oh, what's it doing there? Julie, have you left this here? <laughs>